Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello everyone and welcome to the Canadian Club Toronto. My name is David Simmons. I'm the president uh, of the Canadian Club for this season. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. As we begin today's meeting, I wanted to acknowledge I'm joining you from downtown Toronto, the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today's meeting is taking place on the home of over 70,000 diverse Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Indigenous peoples are the original caretakers of this land, and we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here. Well, 82% of eligible Canadians have been vaccinated against COVID-19. This is in large part thanks to the dedicated efforts of healthcare professionals, life science researchers, and leaders on the last mile of care, including healthcare distribution workers, procurement leaders, and logistic partners. This week, Ontario joined other provinces and jurisdictions from around the world further easing COVID restrictions. So as we look forward to what's next and a return to some level of a new normal, I'm sure many of us are wondering how prepared we are for future pandemics. Well, today we're joined by Patricia Gauthier to hear more about Moderna's contributions to the ongoing battle against COVID-19 and other disease states. She will share lessons that we can learn and that she's gleaned over the last two years, launching what is effectively a startup here in Canada. Before we hear from our speakers, I wanted to give you some information on how you can participate. On your screen, you'll see click here to switch stream buttons that will help if your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality will remain strong. You'll also see a questions tab where you can answer, enter questions into the window and we'll send those to our moderator. There is also a request help button located in the top right corner of the page for technical support. Today's event was made possible with the help of the generous sponsorship from McKesson, Canada's leading healthcare distributor and solutions partner. We're grateful for your support and for you helping to enable today's discussion. Patricia is joined in conversation by Carolyn Jarvis, Chief Investigative Correspondent for Global News. 
If you have a drink nearby, I'll ask you to join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. Now let me turn the podium over to my friend, former colleague, and fellow Western alum, Rebecca McKillican, Chief Executive Officer of McKesson Canada. Rebecca? Thank you so much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, bonjour à tous. Um, I'm so thrilled um, to be able to introduce our esteemed guest today. Um, through this pandemic, um, we as Canadians have come together and at McKesson Canada, we have focused heavily on ensuring that medications continue to flow across this country to support patients and Canadians alike. And we couldn't have done that without our partners, um, including Moderna, in terms of supporting Canadians and their health care. And um, we have been so thrilled to be able to work with uh, partners like Moderna as we've distributed over 9 million COVID-19 vaccines, a lot of which have come from Moderna um, to pharmacies and institutions across this country. And so we're thrilled um, with our biopharma partners like Moderna to be able to support the healthcare of Canadians. And so today I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce Patricia Gauthier. Um, Patricia has spent uh, a lot of time leading healthcare organizations, and she may not know it, but we both have one thing in common, and that is we both started leading healthcare institutions through a pandemic, and that's no easy feat. In 2020, Patricia began her role as general manager of Moderna Canada, with a mandate to set up and lead Moderna's organization in Canada. Previously, Patricia spent 12 years with GSK where her roles included head of vaccines business and head of government affairs and market access. In addition to holding a law degree, Patricia has also earned her MBA from HEC Montreal and possesses certificates in strategic negotiation from Harvard Business School and leadership in context from IMD. She's a creative thinker, an innovator, and an inspirational leader. And I think we can all attest to the overwhelmingly positive impact that Patricia and her organization have had on the healthcare of Canadians over the past year. She'll have a unique and unparalleled insight into the happenings past, present, and future as it relates to vaccines and as it relates to healthcare overall. And I'm greatly looking forward to hearing from you, Patricia. And moderating today's discussion, we are also fortunate to have Carolyn Jarvis of Global News, award-winning chief investigative correspondent. Carolyn has unparalleled ability to seek accountability, to expose the truth, and piece together complex stories through her reporting. Her work has led to lasting and positive change in society in countless ways. So without further delay, welcome Patricia and Carolyn to our fireside chat. Thank you so much, Rebecca and David, for, for having me today. Really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Merci beaucoup et un grand plaisir d'être avec vous tous aujourd'hui. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, David. And thank you to everyone who is watching today. A reminder that we'll be taking your questions. Uh, we've got an iPad here charged up, ready to receive your queries for Patricia. Thank you for being here, of thank course. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, I'd like to start off at the beginning. In column A, it's December 2020. You're living in Toronto. You've got kids who are doing virtual homeschool like many other parents across the country. you got a team of 85 at GSK. Your career is on a meteoric rise. And here's Moderna that doesn't yet have an approved product in column B. What makes you take the leap and decide to go over here? Yeah. It feels a bit crazy when I listen to it that way. <laughs> Your words, don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I come from an entrepreneurial family and, you know, small business. My parents, you know, we lived and breathed business when I was little. And then, and yet I always worked in large organizations, but I had that little firing me that wanted to do something a bit more smaller, agile, nimbler, moving faster. And I've learned a ton in my legal career, in my big pharma career. I think it has really helped me become the leader I am today. But I was at that point where I was looking for my next opportunity, which could have been a global role uh, within my previous organization, or just trying something completely new and different. And key pillars that have guided me in my career over the years has been choosing roles where I have like really big challenges, like getting up in the morning and feeling like, hmm, I'm not sure how we're gonna solve this, but we're gonna you know, work as a team and figure it out. That really drives me. Learning, growing is really a key driver. And then working on projects that really have an impact. And when I look at the Moderna opportunity, it really checked all these boxes and more. So 
you know, it felt like a big leap of faith uh, when I called my previous um, manager and I said, well, I'm going to Moderna. He was like, are you really sure? And I was like, uh, no, I'm not. This feels like bungee jumping, but I really <laughs> need to do this. Like, I feel like I need to try this and do this. And now looking back, I mean, it's been, um, you know, the ride of a, a career in a lifetime and it's been an amazing journey. So you take the plunge. It's early December. And the submission to Health Canada is just about underway. It's underway, but you don't have approval yet. Tell me what those first initial weeks were like. Yeah. So looking back, and I have like December 24th, Minister Anand on the tarmac. And my goal was like, we need to get there. So day one in the job, you know, there's not, no such thing as a 90-day plan at Moderna. By day two, the 90-day plan is out the window and it's irrelevant because we're moving so fast. So the first three weeks were really spent understanding what do we need to do to get doses from Europe into Canada. So working very closely with our, our key partners that were uh, working with the Canadian government as well to make sure that we had all the different steps, the approvals, the distribution establishment license, all these little logistic steps that I had never worked on in my life that all mapped out and, and ready to go. In the meantime, working very closely with the global regulatory team that was actually working with Health Canada on a seven days a week, 18 hours a day, wow. you know, answering questions back and forth, providing more information to make sure we could, um, you know, achieve um, an authorization as fast as possible. And in the middle of all that, our, CF, our CEO, Stephen Bensel, was like, well, Patricia, welcome to Moderna. What's your plan for Canada for the next couple of years? So you're presenting to me December. For two years. For, yeah, like, what's, what's your plan? What's your vision for Canada? So December 13th. I was like day 13th or 14th in the job and I presented to Stefan our plan for Canada, which included we need to get to December 24th and bring doses to the country. Like that's like first step. Um, but at the same time, let, Stefan, let me talk to you about uh, the vision I have for Moderna in Canada, which would include having a footprint, having not just a commercial organization, but really working with key partners here in Canada to, you know, to, to, work with them, benefit from the science, like scientific expertise they have, but also really bring the full power of Moderna to Canada. So, so you come on board and you're literally employee number one for Moderna Canada. Yeah. It only existed on paper. <laughs> exactly. And so was there an office? We have a registered office. A re okay. <laughs> In British Columbia, <laughs> of okay. all places. So that's no good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I, we were all working from home. I mean, I, I was alone for about two months here in Canada, very much supported by a big global team, a lot of key uh, partners here in Canada, and then we started building the team. But everybody has been working from home for the past 10 months. In the early days of the vaccine rollout, there was a lot of heat in Canada for us not getting vaccine supply quick enough, for us not having a domestic manufacturing capability in Canada. What was that like behind the scenes? So, you know, there, there's always many sides to um, a story or to a perspective. To me, what gave me a lot of energy and confidence was the relentlessness of the teams globally and locally working on bringing vaccines to Canada as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. so we need to, like, take a step back a little bit. And, you know, in March, the WHO declared a pandemic. We had been working on a COVID-19 vaccine for a couple months by then. But everybody back then, first of all, Moderna did not have any approved vaccine. This was a first for us. And people were saying, well, it's going to take a couple of years to develop a vaccine. Well, within 11 months, Moderna and, and Pfizer as well had vaccines approved here in Canada. And then when you continue looking at perspective here, it was a first for Moderna, first product approved you know, ever in our life. We're a small biotechnology company from Cambridge that had about 1,200 employees in 2019, and we're past 2,500 to this day. So growing really fast. But back then, we had never manufactured a vaccine to a commercial scale, let alone a pandemic scale. So we had to ramp up on supply chain. We had to ramp up on in the US, but also globally to fulfill the need of that pandemic. So I felt like we were doing everything we could. People were working seven days a week, many, many hours a day to bring doses to the country, working with our partners. 
And yes, the pressure was there. I mean, you know, like everybody else, I wanted my family to be vaccinated as fast as we could. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted Canadians to be vaccinated as fast as we could. I mean, I'm Canadian. Let me tell you, I was I was hustling really hard with global colleagues to get doses here as, as soon as we could. But at the same time, I knew we were doing everything we could. So when I, I look at this, I understand why there was pressure in the system, which is completely normal. But there was a global pandemic, and I really had the assurance working with the teams that we were turning every stone to, to bring products here as soon as we could. Can you look back now and, and, and identify some of the key stumbling blocks that, that prevented us from getting doses here more quickly? Was it setting up the infrastructure to create it? Was the European supply chain, was it getting it out of the States? Was it political administration? Yeah. What was the adversity you faced through that time? Well, I think that the big piece um, is we didn't have a supply chain to manufacture commercial products. Mm -hmm. And we did not have a supply chain to manufacture a product to a pandemic scale. Like pandemic scale mean vaccinating the world. That's massive. And to this day, there are not like 20 manufacturers making vaccines and, and you know, providing vaccines to, to the world. So while it, it was not a hurdle, it was like we had to take the time it takes to set up our supply chain, both increasing in the US, but also building it in Europe, there was no supply chain at the beginning of 2020 in Europe. So working with partners there to ramp up. And when you ramp up, well, it takes more time. You need to learn. And, and you know, the ramp up doesn't happen like this, but it happens like, you know, a curve. So I think um, that was not a stumbling block. I think it was just a normal part of the process. But looking back at things I would have done maybe differently is sharing more of that story of, of what it means to ramp up painting that story a bit more so that people could understand and, and maybe, you know, appreciate all the efforts that uh, were, were being done. And I know people were very much appreciative, but understanding the efforts mm -hmm. um, in, in context. And then, you know, politically, the government of Canada was like at the top of everything, like really, like when we had the European um, exportation measures, like there were a lot of discussions there. So really, really, I think the Canadian government worked really hard to remove all the political barriers that could have happened. So I think it's really thinking about, you know, pandemic needs, need for ramp up, uh, but also looking back and thinking about, we had a goal to vaccinate all Canadians by the end of Q3 and all Canadians, there was enough vaccines in August to actually vaccinate all Canadians. So two, three months, you know, ahead of schedule. So I think when you look at this, um, from all these different angles, I think the outcome is is extremely positive. That relationship with the government you touched on, how different was that for, I mean, it was a new relationship for Moderna Canada, obviously, but traditionally, uh, how much of a shift was it vis-a-vis -vis what we see with pharmaceutical companies and, and government regulators? Yeah. And it's interesting because I had worked with some of the team at Procurement Services of Canada in my previous life and then changing over, but then we got to work with many more stakeholders. And I have to say that one of my biggest, um, one of the biggest learning that I really hope we take forward is the collaboration we were able to develop with the government and all the different stakeholders. And when I think about what that collaboration, what were the key success factors to that collaboration? I have a few that really comes to mind. One is we were all in this together to fight a common objective. We all wanted to fight the pandemic and find um, you know solutions so very much solutions oriented towards a same goal mm -hmm. and i think that really united us in looking at things um, you know from different angles but with the same objective the other piece is embracing healthy tension we all <laughs> is that couch language what do you mean by that <laughs> well i mean we all have different agendas we all play a different role but when you let these roles play out around the table Everybody brings something very valuable. And then when you mix this on the table and embrace that healthy tension of saying like, you know what, I don't see things the way you see it, but you're bringing a good point, which makes me think about B, C, and D, then you find stronger solutions. So I think to me that that's a key part. It's not always comfortable when you're in it, mm -hmm. but I think it's important. Um, another piece is radical transparency. I mean, we had some pretty tough conversations. Um, you know, we had some bumps along the road, which- With the government. Yeah. I mean, we had some schedules on, on supply we needed to, to deliver. And, and, you know, sometimes 
we didn't have any inventory. We had chosen at Moderna to l deliver our vaccines as soon as they were released, like quality released, which meant that there was no inventory for us to use to alleviate some bumps along the road or to alleviate for a one or two day delay, which always happens in vaccine. Vaccine manufacturing is one of the hardest thing we can do in, in pharma. So these little bumps around, the, you know, across the road um, led to some need for really transparent conversation, which I think really helped build trust. And these transparent conversations sometimes may have sounded like, you know, me calling Minister Anand and saying, I don't have all the information, but I'm calling you right now to let you know that there will be a little bump on the road. And I'm committed to working with your team and our team and all the stakeholders to just finding the, the solution and we will get there. And I think we've proven that we were able to get there, but sometimes it took a little detour and these little detour required some transparent conversations, but it really helped us build trust um, and, and really trusting that we were all working towards the same objective, turning every stone we could to achieve our objective of fighting the pandemic. Another announcement that came from the government in partnership with Moderna was the new biomanufacturing site. We've got a question from the audience here about uh, <laughs> but where it's going to be located. <laughs> I'm sure you'd love to answer that question right here. Where is it going to be? <laughs> so the great news about Canada, it's a large country with a lot of expertise and great science and manufacturing capabilities across the country. So there's a lot of different opportunities and possibilities across the country. We are right now working with different provinces, different stakeholders to do some assessment. In parallel to that, which is also very important, we are working with the Canadian government to close the, 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 um, the definitive uh, manufacturing um, you know, agreement as well. So a lot of things moving in parallel here, but this will really set us up, all of us, like the Canadian government, provinces, the different manufacturers, the CDMOs that will be involved in fill and finish and things like that. Uh, for future success and to really ensure we have a sustainable solution to future pandemic in Canada. So we're going to mark that down as a dodge. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll find out where it is later. Uh, let's it talk hasn't about, been decided. Yeah, fair enough. It's fair <laughs> enough. It's early days yet. Um, let's talk about what the pipeline holds in terms of the coronavirus vaccine. We're shifting now an eye to pediatrics. Uh, what are we seeing in terms of clinical development for a pediatric vaccine? Yeah, so we had just yesterday, we had our interim data for children between six and 11 years of age, which shows a very positive safety profile and very positive or strong immune response. So this is interim data. We, we now need to have like future analysis, uh, but this is very positive, which now leads us to be able to have conversations with Health Canada and, and start thinking about you know, that submission. So we will be submitting to Health Canada soon. I don't have a specific date, but it will be coming um, in the next little while. So that's for pediatric. For booster vaccine, we have submitted our booster um, submission to Health Canada at the beginning of the month. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, still going back and forth on some questions and things like that. And then we are um, awaiting for a decision from Health Canada. We've seen the FDA, we've seen the EMA yesterday approve a booster um, indication for a COVID-19 vaccine. So there are a lot of different things that are in the works for the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition to that, we continue working on, do we need another updated vaccine? Should there be a variant of concern that is not well controlled with the current vaccine we have? So we're working on different, we always assess, like now mm -hmm. there's the Delta Plus va um, variant of concern. We're assessing like, how is our, our vaccine protecting against that? So, but we would be ready to go should there be a need for an updated vaccine. The data suggests that the original formulation, and that's the one you're using in your booster, still holds up against the dominant variants of concern in circulation. Yes, it's very effective against all the uh, variants of concerns, including the Delta, which is the most uh, common one right now in Canada. So very strong um, immune response. And I think when we talk about the booster, it's more of a over time, your immune um, response starts waning. Mm -hmm. And now we're all going to go back indoors, you know, kind of like starting some normal life activities that mm -hmm. we couldn't do last year. So I think as the winning immunity goes down a little bit, 
while the vaccine still holds, but that variants of concerns emerge and we go back indoor, it's more of that mix of like, at what point do we need a booster to make sure we continue being protected? Well, the timing is a big question because a lot of Canadians, of course, will be looking stateside where they have approved yeah. boosters for certain populations, 65 plus, and those deemed at high risk. And they'll be saying, well, why aren't we doing boosters here? Uh, the timeline that Moderna is suggesting is six months. Is that correct? Yes. After your second shot? Yes. And what's the science saying there? After six months, that's where we need to get concerned? So what we're, we've seen in our uh, phase three data is that we start seeing an increase in breakthrough crates cases after the six month mark. And then we see more breakthrough cases, which then leads us to believe that at six months, your immune system starts waning enough that now you're a bit more at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Canada, we've had, you know, a dosing schedule that was a bit different depending on, on availability of, of supplies. I think NACI will have to come out with a recommendation to support provinces in their vaccination programs. Got it. And NASI so far has only said immunocompromised people and then in certain provinces we're seeing long-term care home residents. Yes. So we're still waiting on Health Canada for yes. decisions on that. But there's a lot of other boosters that Moderna has in the pipeline. You've you're got boosters in development looking at the Delta variant, at the Beta variant, and you even got one in combination with the flu vaccine. Yes. So it could be something that we get every year? Yes. So the... <laughs> The COVID-19 vaccine has proven that the mRNA platform that Moderna has works in vaccines. So what we're going to see now is an inc we're going to see our pipeline in infectious disease and vaccines really accelerate. So um, we are working on a COVID plus influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. We will be eventually working on a COVID plus influenza plus RSV vaccine, potentially because we're developing all the mono components of these vaccines. We're working on an influenza vaccine alone and working on an RSV vaccine alone as well. And then the goal is, could we have a pan-respiratory vaccine that once a year, if you're, you know, if you're at risk, you can get one shot, be protected against three diseases. So that's really our, our ambition and objective. Wow. Uh, Moderna announced, uh, forgive me, I'm going to skip ahead because we talked about buying manufacturing. Uh, when you talk about Moderna having a footprint in Canada and your growth here from being employee number one, where do you see this company and its footprint in Canada expanding? Yeah. So when I just think about the past 10, 11 months, it's pretty, um, I don't know what's the right word, but it's quite impressive the growth we've already seen. I mean, it started with employee number one. At the end of, of January, we had employee number two, and then every month we had more employees. And at this point, there are 10 of us, like located in Canada for the Canadian organization. Mm -hmm. What I love to see as well is that we have Canadian employees supporting the global organization that are also based here in Canada, which really speaks to the talent of Canadians and really going across borders to get the best talent we can. So we'll continue growing from a, a resourcing um, you know, perspective. We also have a model where we work very closely with many different partners for things or for functions that we choose to, to work that way with. So it's not just the number of employees we have, it's also all the partners that we work with in Canada. And I think our footprint there is growing and continues. What we also want to look at is how can we tap into the really strong science uh, that the Canadian life science ecosystem has to offer. And here I'm thinking about partnerships with universities, research organizations. How do we bring more clinical trials to Canada? How do we improve some of our ways of working in Canada to just facilitate organizations doing more and, and accelerating um, you know, projects here in Canada so that, I mean, Moderna, our vision is really to go beyond being a commercial organization and really having a footprint across all of these different areas, you know, from um, scientific research, artificial intelligence, clinical trial, and, and you know, potential business development deals um, as we've been doing for, for some years as well. And to be clear, when we're talking about Moderna's fleet of products, we're not just talking about a COVID-19 vaccine. We're talking about five plus areas of development. Can you shed some light on those? Yes. So vaccine is kind of where we're very much going like full speed because the platform has de risk that area. So we're seeing an increase, like the speed will be, you know, increased because we have that backbone that has been proven in vaccines. So we have quite a few vaccines from influenza, RSV, cytomegalovirus, um, Epstein-Barr, HIV, Zika, and others. 
But in addition to that, Moderna is not just a vaccine company. We're a platform company. We have an information molecule that we believe will really help us meet unmet medical needs in other areas. And here I think about oncology. I think about autoimmune disease. I think about cardiovascular diseases and rare diseases. So there are very many different therapeutic areas where we are working hard to bring the full promise of the mRNA technology. So somebody battling cancer will be looking at a company like Moderna, whose vaccine has taken off and solved many of the problems the world is facing today, saying, when can I get my hands on a cancer treatment that will help me in my ailment? To that sort of person watching today, what would you say? Well, we are in clinical, um, in clinical phase with our oncology products. So working hard, I mean, there's, there's no speed at Moderna other than fast and sense of urgency. So I can assure, um, you know, everybody listening that we are very committed to bringing our pipeline to, uh, of products to patients as fast as we can. And we have many clinical trials in fields such as oncology. And then we hope that, you know, once if we have positive data, then you can even accelerate further. Do you think because we've established a new way of partnering with the government in terms of regulatory approvals, you fed them information as it was ready, we could see other therapeutics, other vaccines, cancer treatments approved more quickly as opposed to the old traditional way of doing things? This is my hope. This is really my hope. And I have to say that again, I, I really want to salute the, the Health Canada has been a fantastic partner through this. We are, the, and Health Canada currently is doing a consultation on the modernization of the regulatory processes for, for that they use. Thinking about what are the learnings from the pandemic that we can actually embed. And Moderna will be submitting, like many other pharma companies and, and the industry uh, associations will be submitting, um, you know, a, a little letter um, sharing with them our thoughts and, and ideas. And on this, we think about rolling submissions. I mean, this process really has worked. And now it's like, okay, how do we, how do we expand this to not only rolling submissions for assets, but maybe a rolling submission for if you need to apply for a distribution establishment license, what's the process there so that we can actually accelerate further? How can we bring clinical trials faster to Canada? So how can we create maybe um, a harmonized, centralized process with one ethics review and faster approval on that front? That would serve everybody. So we have a few thoughts like that, that you know, we are discussing with Health Canada, we'll be summoning our thoughts, but I can say that the openness that they've shown and the willingness to just continue partnering and doing things in, in a way we've been doing this, I hope in a much more sustainable way, everybody has been working flat out and I don't think that's sustainable. So we don't wish that on anybody, but I think there are good processes we've put in place that we can definitely um, leverage into the future. We've got another question for the audience. And just a reminder to anybody who's uh, viewing, watching today to submit your questions. Patricia would love to answer them. <laughs> I hope so. Um, okay, question, here we go. What are the top challenges facing your team over the next year? That's a great question. I mean, we have a team of 10-ish, very dedicated, selfless, relentless, and bold um, employees, and will be growing. And I think one of our key challenge is we need to move from firefighting and fighting the pandemic to becoming a Canadian organization. We need to build you know, our team. Now we're growing. We'll have people reporting into the, the leadership team. So how do we build a strong Canadian organization with a culture that is very much aligned to the Moderna culture of being bold, curious, collaborative, um, and at the same time, you know, kind of have it, its own little Canadian color to it and, and very much focus on the same objective. So I think that's a really, you know, nice challenge. I think we want to be these um, collaborative partners in the ecosystem. I mean, through the biomanufacturing agreement, through our commitment to life science and, and research and innovation. So bringing these partnerships to life, finding solutions, not going back to we've always done it like that, let's do it like that, but actually finding more effective ways to achieve even bigger impact, I think will be uh, a challenge that our team, you know, will be focused on tackling together. Another question from uh, the audience is about vaccine hesitancy, and that's been something we've been seeing a lot stateside, but there is still an entrenched group of people who are hesitant towards any sort of vaccines. A lot of that is directed towards the mRNA technology, which they might argue uh, was untested at the time. 
How do you respond to that? And how do we reach those people in a meaningful way? Yeah. So our team has been working very closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada to support their education efforts. They, they've, and, and Public Health Agency of Canada and all the various provinces have been working really hard in trying to provide all the right information for Canadians to make an informed decision. So we've been partnering with them to support their efforts. We've been doing some of our, our own initiatives ourselves as well, um, you know, in, in ways that hopefully helps people better understand what is the mRNA platform? What is it? It's just an information molecule, uh, you know, really helping people understand that. And I think we have more work to do on that front. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's still a very new technology. So a lot of the focus of, you know, our, our team, both the medical team, marketing team, and, and customer engagement team will be on making sure people fully understand that platform and new technology to build confidence into the platform and the technology. And on vaccine confidence, I think it's really working with the different stakeholders to reach as many Canadians as we can. I think with an 80% vaccination rate mm -hmm. in Canada, it's quite phenomenal. It yes, great. we can get to 100%, and I do hope we get do there. Do you think so? Do you really think so? Well, I would hope we can, but I think there will always be a core group that mm -hmm. might be harder to move. So I think it's more, how do we make sure that as the booster comes, as pediatric vaccine comes, that you know we don't go back to maybe a higher level of vaccine hesitancy when i think about vaccination rates for influenza as an example it's way lower than 88 percent so what we've achieved with that 88 percent i think is if i look to the future it's like how do we keep this forward how do we keep what we've we've been able to achieve from a vaccine education and building confidence so that, you know, as we move forward, we have similar vaccination rates for influenza, for other diseases that actually are, are you know, uh, very important to be protected against. Are you anticipating that there may be increased hesitancy, hesitancy when it comes to the pediatric vaccines? People are cautious with their kids for yeah. that reason. Yeah, I don't know if I would call it hesitancy. I think there will be a lot of questions, and rightly so. I mean, I think as a parent myself, you know, if... I've been swimming in this for 11 months. But if I wasn't, I would be reading up and I would be asking questions. I think what's really important here is read multiple sources of information. Yeah. Social media, know that there's an algorithm behind and it will feed you what you tend to read. So I think really try to be really informed to make your own decisions. Speak with your healthcare professionals, speak with your pharmacist, speak with your physician to get the information you need to make a decision. But also know that clinical trials and vaccine development is never taken lightly. It took longer. It's taking longer to bring the pediatric vaccine to market for a reason, because you know we're being very careful with these pediatric um, clinical trials, and, and rightly so. So there's a lot of rigor behind it. Hindsight being what it was, though, do you think we were fast enough out of the gates in communicating, and this is not just Moderna, but Health Canada, public health agencies, provincially and federally, in communicating what mRNA was? I remember speaking with Health Canada back last fall before any vaccine was approved, and they said, well, we're going to wait to figure out which vaccines are approved to yeah. communicate what they were. And other experts were countering, well, no, no, that's too late, actually. When you look back at what's transpired, What's your judgment on that now? I think we could have done more. I will also say that I think we were doing everything we could at the moment. <laughs> so it, it's a bit of that, mm -hmm. you know, balance. I think the focus back then was like, let's bring doses to the country. Let's make sure that the doses once in country reach points of vaccination. Let's make sure that vaccinators have the information they need to be able to administer vaccines. And I think as you know, time has passed. I think there's been more done on that um, education part. So I think what we need to do now is looking at that and think about what can we do more of and how do we continue doing that to, to build a stronger base in terms of understanding. We talked about pediatric vaccines a moment ago, and a question from the audience is about why is Pfizer's vaccine um, seeking regulatory approval for the 5 to 11-year-olds, whereas Moderna's 6 to 11? Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to what has informed the Pfizer decision. What I can say is Moderna is going from 6 to 11, which is typically the standard way of looking at a pediatric vaccine. And for younger kids, when might that come? So younger kids, we are conducting clinical trials in the 2 years old to 5 years old, and then we'll be conducting 
six months old to two years old, and really happy to say that there, there are Canadian sites for the Kids Cove trial. That's great. Another question from the audience. What data, research, technology, infrastructure would Moderna need to grow its footprint in Canada? Oh, that's a really good question. If I take a really big step back and thinking about what helps when you're um, a startup, small organization trying to do a lot of things at the same time with, to this day, 2,500 employees in the world, ease of doing things comes first to mind. Mm -hmm. Remove the red tape, create centralized one-stop shop for, for activities. So now I'm you know, thinking out loud, but could we have a central clinical trial network? So we go one place, everything gets done, and then you have all your sites. How do we partner with universities and key scientists in their field, but across Canada? without having to go from one institution to another, as an example. Like, how do we create these forums that just are enablers to go faster and be able to do more? Another question from our audience, and thanks to everyone who's contributing these, keep them coming. Gaps in intellectual property protection has been historically cited as a reason why Canada does not have a strong life sciences division. Has this changed? And how did Moderna get comfortable with overcoming this cha challenge and invest in Canada? So, I mean, great question. I mean, we're a R&D science-based organization or our IP is very critical. Um, you know, I think, and we're looking at IP globally and we are filing our IP here in Canada as well. So I think it's really, we need to continue partnering with the Canadian government to make sure that the Canadian market remains a highly competitive market for research organizations, not just pharma, all types of research organizations to want to come here and do business here. So I think it's always like, let's make sure we're always remaining competitive there. And what else can we do to, to close that gap if, if needed? Next one. Uh, do you see future possibilities for other biopharmaceutical companies to be able to leverage Moderna's mRNA platform for their own molecules R&D? Hmm, that's a great question for a business development team <laughs> back in Cambridge. So um, happy to have offline conversations if there are different opportunities, but that'd be a great question for them. Is Moderna concerned about the supply chain? Is there a concern regarding the scarcity of inputs to continue development of its vaccine? So I think we're in a good place right now with, you know, we have many, many different partners across the world from, um, you know, on, on all inputs of the supply chain. So I don't see scarcity, but I don't think we're in overabundance either. So, um, but we are very much secured for, for you know, what's to come in the next few years. And I think all of us, our partners and the different stakeholders in the ecosystem have a lot of reflections as well around how do we make sure that in a future pandemic, should there be another one? And when you listen to WHO disease X, there will be another disease X. Disease X was COVID-19 in 2019. So let's, let's get ready for the next one. How do we make sure that we don't have gaps in supply chain? But that goes beyond biopharma. Like that's, we saw it with mask. We saw it with um, aseptic gel. Like it, it, it's across. So I think it's more around either how we build it or how do we build models where, you know, organizations can quickly, you know, pivot to, to supporting this, as we've seen with many Canadian organizations that just stepped in and started making masks and, and you know, gowns for hospitals out of, um, you know, out of necessity this mm -hmm. year, which is quite inspiring. On a personal side, people on occasion reflect on the gifts of the pandemic. Is there something that you can look back on the last year um, that you're thankful for that the pandemic has provided? Mm -hmm. A new perspective, perhaps a change in leadership? Yeah. I'm a optimistic person. And, and when I look at the pandemic, and while there's been a lot of difficult times in the pandemic, on a really personal note, I worked extremely hard. The hardest I've worked since I left private practice. But I was home. I was home with my kids. I wasn't traveling, which made me realize I was traveling a lot more than I was making myself believe. And while I was working, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, I could always come out and have a quick dinner and then go back to my office. Or they could come in, sit on a chair, 
and listen to me while I'm in meetings or ask a quick question for homework while, you know, trying to manage a few different pieces. So then in itself, what it had, a, while it had a lot of challenges, I think really gave me very precious time with them and even opportunities to teach. You know, they, they, they started, they went from playing teacher to playing boss at some point because they were just like mimicking what they were hearing. Um, I think from a leadership perspective, I really hope we don't wait for the next global crisis as a catalyst for change. We leaped, transformed this year, like massive transformation mm -hmm. that at, I think have been years in the making with like incremental transformations, but we really had a catalyst for change. I really hope that all leaders across the world continue with that bold mentality of catalyst for change. If something is not delivering the full potential it could deliver. Let's fix it. Let's learn continuous improvement. Let's not settle for what is. Is there a question that people who know you as Patricia, not the Moderna GM Canada or former GSK executive, stop you on the street and ask you about this pandemic or your role most frequently? What's the question you get the most? I, I think the question you asked at the beginning, like, why did you make that leap? Why did you take the job? Yeah. <laughs> like, what were you thinking? Um, is a question I often get. But again, I have made a bold move when I left private practice a couple of years from partnership to be a sales rep at GSK and start all the way up, you know, in pharma. So I think to me that that boldness is just part of how, you know, I guess I like to, to keep being challenged. Um, and, and, you know, I will get a lot of the similar questions we talked about today around like, you know, when there were supply scarcity, there was a lot of like, you know, questions around that. Um, but that's more on the per, like the professional front. So I think on the personal front, the question you asked at the beginning was a good one. Was there ever a time in the last year where you wanted to hit the Control Z button, the undo button? Um, I wouldn't do not the undo button. I think I've had very transparently quite a few sleepless nights of like, whew, how are we going to solve this next puzzle and this next challenge? But I really had confidence that we had the right team in place at Moderna in Canada, globally, with our, our external partners and uh, with our key stakeholders and provinces and, you know, in the federal government that we would find solutions. So it was not undo. It was more like, let's quickly check and adjust because that was required. We had to keep moving forward with no playbook and accept it wouldn't be perfect. We would need to like zigzag a little bit. But I think that check and adjust mindset has helped me to like just keep moving forward and having open dialogues to find solutions with partners. Another question from the audience. We've got a few more minutes if anybody wants to throw in any last questions here. Is Moderna open to partner with Canadian academic institutions and other companies to expand the biomanufacturing capacity? So, you know, I think we're, we're open to having discussions and look at what can be. I think that's what I would say right now. Um, we have our own project, which is quite defined and we will move forward with. But then in terms of you know, pandemic preparedness, for example, I think there is a lot of work we need to do to make sure that we are ready for the next pandemic. And I think that will not be Moderna alone. It will not be public health agency alone. That will be a collaboration that could come from a, a you know, um, a multi academic, a, a, academic yeah. or, or multi stakeholder. Well, in the spirit of collaboration, another question here about whether or not um, Moderna would consider an approach where pharmaceutical companies would partner among themselves and among other bio leaders. So I think the pandemic has showed us that many pharma companies started collaborating. We've seen the unusual deals of pharma companies lending their manufacturing sites or fill and fill and finish line to another big pharma to make products and go faster. So in the US, we're partnering with Sanofi as an example. So I think this is already happening. We've also partnered with um, pharma companies to do clinical trials where you could have co-administration of vaccines. So I think this is happening and it's, this is definitely an area that we can continue um, exploring where it makes sense to, to bring more innovation. Uh, did you expect the COVID vaccine to have an 80 plus percent effectiveness rate? It's even higher than that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we're at 93 uh, percent. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Fact check. Uh, lots of vaccines would tend to be around 50 to 60 percent. Does mRNA technology make vaccines more effective generally? So absolutely right that I think the mRNA platform have shown a really high level of efficacy that is quite 
outstanding, even in the vaccines world. I mean, there are other vaccines that have shown really high um, level of efficacy that are usually with an adjuvant. But the mRNA platform, I think, is a new technology that without an adjuvant can, can show that. And it's all about that information molecule that really has the same sequence as the, as, as the virus um, that you're trying to, to create an immune uh, response for. So we have one proof point right now that shows that the mRNA vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, is highly efficacious. And we do believe scientifically that this is a good foundation to believe that the future mRNA vaccine can be can show a really high efficacy. But we'll see this with the data coming as we, we bring these assets to market. If we were to have this conversation one year from now, what are the boxes you would like to have checked by that point? So, I mean, I think we checked a lot this year with, with the pandemic. Yeah. A really big one that I'm hoping we're going to really finalize soon is the whole biomanufacturing project with the Canadian government, like finalizing all of the steps that come with it and implementation, you know, um, seeing the shovels into the ground and, and starting building. To me, I mean, at the end of next year, I'd love to be able to say, like, you know, the, the building is taking shape. We have several partnerships from an R&D perspective. We've increased our clinical trial um, number of sites, you know, by a specific number. And we're having impact. To me, it's not about just what we're doing, but it's like, ultimately, what is the impact we're creating for Canadians? So how many Canadians can be involved in projects that we're working in? Um, how are we benefiting Moderna from the expertise we have in Canada, but also how is Moderna contributing to the research that some scientists are doing. So I think in a year or two from now, if I can see some of these ideas or concept really showing proof of concepts or outcomes, I'd be quite pleased. No company grows fast without growing pains. What are some of the growing pains you had along the way? Yeah. I mean, we have nothing. Like nothing existed. Like my first few paychecks did not come in a paycheck. It was like wire transferred. Really? Yeah, because we, we just didn't have a bank account yet in Canada. So it, like small things that you take for granted. Um, there was no, you know, all the benefits had to be started from scratch. The processes, there's no processes. Like it's a lot of like, let's do it. And now I'm, you know, with the team, I'm like, okay, let's document what we're doing so that we're not reinventing the wheel next time we need to do it. But it's a bit of like, let's do document and then, you know, kind of learn from this. So we have everything to build, which I find exciting most days, but sometimes it leads to a lot of like uncertainty, ambiguity, spin. And even within the team, it's like, well, who does what? Well, I don't know. It's in, it's in nobody's job description. Who's got time? No one. Okay. Well, who can pick it up? Let's go. So there's a lot of that. I mean, we're, we're really small. And I think that requires a lot of checking and adjusting by, by everybody mm -hmm. and accepting that Maybe in two, three years from now, we'll be a more mature organization, but having the faith and vision will get there and accepting that along the way, you know, we're still all working from home. Things won't be perfect, but we'll get to an office. We'll get to being together. We'll get to having, you know, a bit of infrastructure that other organizations have, but it takes time. It's been 11 months now and, and we're still working on many of these pieces. We've got time for one last question and we're going to throw it back to David momentarily. Point of flattery, you're an aspiring leader, Patricia, says this viewer. How can I join your Moderna team to continue the bold work you do? There you go. Oh, there you go. You're hiring right there on the spot. <laughs> so please look at the at job postings on our website. I mean, things are there. We're growing. We're, we also want to grow responsibly because, you know, we've more than doubled in size, but we need to make sure that we are thinking about where people go so that we're, we're building in a sustainable way. So i um, always, always happy to speak with key talent and, you know, ambitious and people who have fire in the belly and want to do things differently to but have a bigger are, impact. There are dozens of jobs right now. Yeah, available. globally, definitely globally. like hundreds, hundreds of jobs globally. Uh, we have people based in Toronto that support the Cambridge office. We have people out of Canada supporting the Canadian organization. So many opportunities. I would just consult the website and then uh, look for what is a good fit for you. What is the culture when you, you talked about a, a couple of pillars earlier in our conversation, but what's the sort of person who's a fit for Moderna? Highly autonomous, able to work in ambiguity. Your development plan is not a, oh, I want to get to this job in this amount of time. It's like, learn on the job. What are you look, learning? Have more impact, pick up projects, show what you can do by doing it. 
um, a lot of like just can do attitude and like there's a step back, there's no step back. We're going to turn every stone, find a solution. So really like that fire in the belly, but really thoughtful people are brilliant, like humbly brilliant. So really being thoughtful, being able to do this at a really fast uh, pace and just being afraid maybe, but trying new things and learning from it quickly. Or CEO often says, we don't need to be the brightest, but we need to learn the fastest. And to me, that's quite empowering as a, you know, as an employee and as a leader. Well, that's wonderful. Patricia, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Very enlightening, very appreciated. And David Sim Simmons is uh, ready to take things over. David, over to you. I was on mute. So the pandemic is not over. I'm still on mute. Thank you to you both for a tremendously engaging conversation. I was sitting here thinking, wow, I feel like I'm in the living room talking about what matters uh, to really everyone right now, which is uh, the success you've had as a company here in Canada, around the world. Uh, Patricia, congratulations and, and thanks for all that you've done. Carol and your team has done. And Carolyn, thank you for expert moderation. Uh, way to, you know, as someone who's done media relations, I was like, this, this one's really, really good at her job and it's great. So congrats, that was really fantastic. Um, Patricia, if I can say, you know, I'm supposed to say what I learned from your presentation. Um, I learned a lot and I'm grateful to Canada's broader pharmacy and, and pharmaceutical and bioscience industry. So uh, thank you for being a part of that. But I took away sort of three things on a personal level. Courage matters in today's world and you've demonstrated a lot of courage and Moderna's demonstrated courage. Measured risk matters. Uh, and when you do it right, it pays off as we're seeing. Um, and I just, as I was watching you, I thought more people should bet on themselves and bet on each other because it sounds like that's what you did when you left McCarthy's and when you decided to leave GSK. So thank you for that. And thank you for what you've done. Um, thank you again to McKesson Canada uh, for your sponsorship of today's event. You made today's event accessible to everyone. We had close to 500 people uh, and that's because there was no barrier to access. So we appreciate you, McKesson. Uh, thank you to AV uh, supplier Van Volgenberg Communications and LiveMedia.ca for helping us be together virtually today. Uh, guests, if you'd like, you can join us tomorrow. We'll have a virtual discussion with the former uh, governor of the Bank of Canada, David Dodge. He's going to share insights into Canada's future economy. And on Tuesday, November 2nd, we're hosting uh, Eric Martel, President and CEO of Bombardier, in person here in Toronto. He'll talk about his vision for Bombardier and the role that Ontario is going to play in their uh, growth strategy. Please visit, visit us on our new website, canadianclub.org. It's great. It's new. There's membership information. We'd love to see you join us. Thanks again for being here. Stay safe, get vaccinated, uh, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.